I thank you, Provost Karin, for these for this inspiring opening remarks. So let's get started with the program. So my name is Thibaut Guiberti. I will be your chairman for this morning. And so today is all about AI for fuel and engine design. And just a quick message for our speakers. If you want to be featured in the recording, this is a nice area to, to be. And you have the feedback screen. All right. So our first speaker is uh, Dr. Sidi Deng. She's an assistant professor at MIT. She received her PhD in mechanical engineering from Princeton University, and she also did a postdoc at Stanford University. And she will talk about chemical reaction, neural network for energy applications. Good morning. All right, can you hear me all right? Great. Very nice meeting you all. Uh, like introduced, uh, I'm Zili Deng, an assistant professor in mechanical engineering at MIT. It's my great honor to be able to speak at this uh, prestigious conference. Like we mentioned previously, uh, the chat GPT, right? I, I play with it as well. I got so amazed by how it can understand human sentiment when you say, write an exciting note, it can do it like that. So in my group at MIT, we are also interested in combining machine learning with uh, combustion. And particularly, we want to develop a scientific machine learning method to understand physical and, and chemical systems. So in that sense, we hope that we can let the machine learning algorithm also understand the fundamental uh, underlying physics associated with it. So today, I'm going to introduce to you uh, a, a framework we recently developed called Chemical Reaction Neural Network. And hopefully, by showing you a few cases, uh, you're convinced that we can actually inform the neural networks about the underlying physics. All right, as many of you are working on the chemical kinetics of combustion, uh, there's a famous plot uh, showing the relationship between the species that is involved in the detailed chemistry associated with the, the, the reactions we might encounter. And this is important not only to the understanding of physics, uh, chemical kinetics, but also very important for people who do combustion simulation, CFDs. There are only a few uh, species that can be considered if we are going to do a high fidelity uh, computation. So as we can see that even after, even around 2010, we are entering this re realm where we're dealing with thousands of reactions and tens of thousands of, uh, thousands of species and tens of thousands of reactions. The, the way we need to handle them can be really computationally uh, expensive. And it takes, for PhD students, you guys understand, it takes years to build a, a, a computational model uh, for, for uh, a detailed fuels, right? So the question we ask ourselves is that, can we obtain such complex model using machine learning and free uh, the human labor? And in that sense, how we can make sure that we are capturing the important physics and chemistry in the machine learning route. So we take a look at the pros and cons of both the physics-based modeling as well as uh, the black box based of uh, machine learning. All right, as you could think of, for the physical models, when we look at it, we can interpret it, the underlying physics. We know what's important, what's less important, right? And we can read it, we can, uh, most importantly is that we validate the mechanism under certain conditions, but because there are physics embedded in it, we expect that even out of this box, we can achieve relatively well fidelity. All right? That's really the power of having these physical laws. For machine learning, on the contrary, it helps us to deal with large quantity of data. And we, we just talked about that in this era, we do have a lot of experimental and computational data. So, the question is how we can get the merit of both, all right? And if we were just doing the uh, black box machine learning, we can do a very well job in terms of the data that we have. And basically, we are trying to find the, the, uh, the optimum within that range. However, it's not guaranteed that if we have a larger design space, this model de derived by machine learning can also give us the optimum when we talk about the entire phase. So that really motivated our group to think about a way that we can get the best from both worlds. How we can incorporate physics into machine learning algorithms such that we can achieve certain level of interpretability as well as generalizability. And this is the work I'm going to introduce to you today. So the fundamental rationale is that we want to leverage machine learning as a tool 
for large-scale optimization and try to be able to deal with the complex chemistry that we're facing today. The other one is that we want to incorporate and inform the neural network in certain ways. In this particular case, it's the architecture of the neural network that we use, such that we can incorporate physics laws into the architecture of the neural network. So the model that we get can be physically interpretable. All right, and let me give you a general example of chemical reactions to set the ground for everyone. So if we are dealing with uh, re chemical reactions from A and B to C and D, it would generally write in this way. And the two fundamental laws that we think are generally true for chemical reactions are the laws of mass actions. Essentially, it tells us how to approximate the reaction rate given certain species and their concentrations. And for combustion particularly, uh, for a lot of chemical systems where the temperature play a very important role, the rate constant K is, not, is a function of temperature. So in that case, we also have a third, another relationship between the rate constant K and temperature as well as the activation energy. All right, so if these are the fundamental laws that we think most of the chemical system would obey, then we can try to incorporate that into the architecture of neural network. Let me walk you through again with a very simple example. So we have methane plus oxygen goes to CO2 and water. Let, and the way we incorporate mass of action law into neural network is by writing down this reaction rate equation and do a teeny tiny mathematical trick to take the exponential and then take the natural log for the others. And very quickly you realize that the concentrations and the, and the rate constant start to have this uh, linear relation uh, Manipulate uh, multiplication as well as addition. All right, and back in recalling the structure of neural network, basically you can think that this activation function is now in a fixed form of this exponential function, and others are just this linear combination of the uh, normalized uh, species concentration as well as this uh, reaction rate constant. And the outputs that we get is the production rate of the species. And the coefficient associated with this neural network, which are the weights and biases, all of a sudden has their physical counterpart in the physical world. So they are the reaction orders, stoichiometric coefficient, as well as the rate constant. So meaning that the ground truth, if they obey these two laws, they are particular uh, solutions to this neural network. Similarly, it's not difficult to understand that if we want to incorporate the Arrhenius law, we just need to express the reaction rate constant as a function of temperature and uh, activation energy as well. And this applies to a single reaction. So if we're interested in a detailed mechanism where we have a lot of reactions, a lot of species, we just need to stack them together. So in the input layer, we have the normalized concentration for all the species as well as temperature. In the hidden layer, actually the number of the nodes now has this physical meaning, representing the number of reactions included in this detailed mechanism. And the output would be the reaction rate for all the species involved, all right? And let me walk you through some uh, proof of concept cases where we know the underlying physics, we use that as a, so we basically utilize the detailed chemistry as a ground truth. And we can generate a numerical or synthetic uh, data. And uh, for this particular case, we are dealing with five species and four reactions. In this case, we didn't need to worry about the temperature dependence on the reaction rate constant. And in the end, the highlight of the work is that By using this new, uh, chem chemical reaction neural network, we can recover the underlying physics. And you can see that all the numerical values matched really, really well. For this highly sparse system, actually we can still extract the important information and only retain most important uh, species and reactions that matches with the underlying physics. 
Next case, we're dealing with a biodiesel production from palm oil. And in this particular case, now the temperature becomes important because it's related to the pyrolysis and the reforming of the reactions. In a nutshell, what we can see is that not only the, the stoichiometric coefficient as well as the rate constant can be reproduced, the sensitivity towards temperature, which is the activation energy, can be also uh, accurately captured within 1% um, of, of error. Finally, this is definitely outside of my field, but we also try to uh, incorporate this neural network and try to demonstrate it in some biochemical systems. And particularly in this case, we're interested in, in cell signaling. Uh, it is a reaction associated with a lot of proteins, which I couldn't understand very well myself. But in the end, what, which it means is that there are certain species that we don't really see, uh, we don't have their uh, physical a formula, but we know some of them act as enzyme. In, in other words, they act as a catalyst. So they show up both in the equation as the reactant and the product, uh, products. In this case, we are still able to capture the interactions between them and be able to figure out the, the chemical reaction rate associated with this very complicated uh, catalytic system. So based on these three proof of concept, we know that if we generate uh, the, the detailed uh, simulation data with the detailed chemistry, we can figure out uh, the ground truth based on the data. And now we turn our eyes into seeing whether this neural network or this framework can tell us something more physical. All right, let me show you this example. So again, this is a palm oil refinery example. We, we have six species and several reactions. And the M1 model is that we give all the species concentrations in time. Basically, we generate the ground truth data. It's a smooth curve. And we add 5% of Gaussian noise to it to mimic the, the uh, measurement noise in, in the data. So that's why you see the data is a little bit uh, noisy. All right. And if we tell the system, OK, look, we, ha we can measure six species. So there are six species involved. Try to figure out a model. And we can get it really well and agree very well with the, with the ground truth. The second case, M2, is that we tell the system we think there are six species involved. However, our, our measurements can only resolve five of them. So we tell them there is a known unknown in the system. And you, you can see from the figure as well, the M2 which is, the, uh, which is the green curve, actually agree very well with the case where we tell the system all six species are known. So our framework can deal with this known and known really well. And third case isn't that pretty. So basically, the, one of the species cannot be observed. And from the modeler point of view, we also didn't know that there is a missing species. In that case, uh, you can see the purple curve it can uh, relatively represent some species, but it failed to predict some other species. Basically, this neural network tells us, OK, we are missing some really important intermediate steps to figure out the entire picture. But it also gives us this opportunity that if we can guess the number of the species and reactions involved, we are able to tell what is the missing physics. And we can treat the number of species and reactions in, because it relates to the number of neurons in the input layer and the hidden layer. So we can treat them as hypoparameters to help us uh, tune the accuracy and balance the accuracy and model size. Here is a demonstration of that. So in this real case, it's more complicated. We are interested in the pyrolysis of biomass, which is which we don't really know what's going on. And in real experiments, most of the time, it's in the TGA, thermographic metric uh, analysis, meaning that you put the fuels into a heating chamber and, uh, uh, and change the heating uh, temperature as a function of time. And then you can measure the, uh, the, the mass of the system, meaning that you can only measure the condensed phase. All right, so we know what we put in. We don't exactly know what we put out, 
uh, we get out, we just know the mass change, and we don't know what's going on in the middle. Whether we can come up with a model that, that can capture the dynamics of the system, whether we can predict some intermediate species and see how it evolves, such that it can help us fine tune the pyrolysis process to get the maximum uh, production of the uh, species. Basically, that's the overarching role. All right, and you would think for machine learning, you definitely need a lot of data. Uh, luckily, in this case, uh, we only demonstrated that with 10 experiments uh, as a training set and four as a validation, we can achieve really good results. So the two stars ones are the validation result, and the, the rest are the training data. So this is the TGA curve, which track the mass change over the heating temperature. All right, and what's the challenges, like I uh, elucidated uh, previously, is that we only have a partial uh, information where we only have the lumped information on the weights rather than the detailed species concentration. So in the end, we need to come up with a neural network that treat the hyperparameters as the, the species involved. So you can see from the left-hand side of this uh, neural network, the input layer, we only know that the thing we put in cellulose and some of them might react with oxygen, but some other intermediate species are treated as pseudo species. So this is what the neural network tells us. All right, it's a gigantic matrix associated with, uh, but, but it already narrowed down that there are only two unknown species, and there are certain rate constant and, and uh, kinetic parameters. Because now our neural network is physically interpretable, we can turn this to a human readable format. Or if you want to have a high level information, this is a network visualization. Essentially it tells us, in order for cellulose to, to pyrolysis and to the final product, you need to at least have two intermediate species. And compared with the literature that we know, is that these two are very likely to be the active cellulose as well as the char. All right, so even if we couldn't measure these two species, we can still, using our model, we can still track how the species evolve. So that later on, if we need to fine tune the uh, operation conditions to say, optimize certain production rate of the active cellulose, we can do that. All right, and next, let me switch tone a little bit since I'm in, we are interested in the, not only in the uh, Fossil fuels or biofuels were also interested in renewables. And you guys know that for renewables harvesting, uh, energy storage always goes hand in hand with the renewable harvesting. And uh, as many sectors are transitioned to be electrified, uh, being able to operate the batteries, lithium and batteries, in a safety manner is of great importance. So we are interested in the fire associated with uh, lithium on um, battery thermal runaway. It's very, not very well understood because it's uh, solid phase reactions and uh, several steps of degradation. And similar to the pyrolysis problem I just mentioned about before, this type of problem is also with uh, hidden information because most of the time we can only track the uh, heating curves in the scanning differential calorimetry. Essentially is that this is how people usually do it, is that uh, they will scrape the materials, for example, the cathode materials, and put it in a small oven, track, heat it up at different heating rates, so, uh, and track the heat release as a function of temperature. And people would run it several times at different heating rates, such that they can track the, where the peak happens and run the Kissinger model, which is more or less assume the unit uh, reaction order as well as independent reactions. So if there's a peak, there's one reaction, all right? And whether this uh, is true in the real physical world for battery thermal runaway, uh, it's debatable, all right? It works really well when we have three distinct peaks, but it does not work really well when we only have two peaks. So we were thinking, we also checked the, the literature in the material science which demonstrated that, yes, there are three stages of reactions because the cathode material turn a degree gauge uh, step by step, and they are in sequence, not independent, and they happen at certain temperatures. So obviously, the current tools cannot solve this problem. 
So we basically incorporated the heat release information in our neural network as well. Previously, we were tracking how the species concentration changes or mass changes. In this particular case, we can add another neuron in the output layer to track how the heat release influences the system. All right, now the weights associated with the heat release path would be the uh, heat of reaction in that case. And uh, in, to give you a nutshell is that not only we can train it on existing data, but also because we have a physical model, we can compute what it would be look like uh, in the same conditions as in uh, the XRD experiments uh, done, by exper uh, done by material scientists. And uh, as we can see that, the peaks, the, the, uh, the new uh, reduced um, uh, deducted um, mechanism can predict the, the windows very well according to the literature. Because we have a physically interpretable neural network, we can extract the physical parameters out of it. Now we have a better understanding why certain materials have better thermal stability compared to the others. Why as the nickel content of this NCM material increases, we have a higher tendency of having this decomposition and therefore we have a higher tendency of having thermal runaway of that material. Finally, I'd like to share with you some recent achievement in this framework is that we add the Bayesian component into it the motivation is this, is that we know the ground truth is one of the solution that the neural network can give, but it's not guaranteed that we only have one uh, model that can be learned by the neural network, given the precision, given the availability of all the data. All right, so there could be multiple models that fit the data really well. And also, in real experiments, it's not that pretty, right? We always have noise. So it's also important to estimate the machine learned model was the uncertainty associated with that and how that uncertainty would propagate when we use that model for predictions. So that's the fundamental uh, assumptions or motivation for this work. So to give you a nutshell, because of we embedded physics into the architecture of neural network, it can do something really uh, amazing, at least to, for us, is that now I'm turning back to the, the five species uh, for reaction scheme is that, as you can see in this figure, that we only fit into the model uh, the time between zero and two seconds as well as after 28 seconds. So pretty benign, uh, pretty uh, slow evolving uh, profiles. The really fast evolving ones, let's assume they cannot be measured in experiments. And it's highly likely to be the case in most experiments. As we can see, by embedding the physics, we can still compensate this data availability, be, still be able to uh, capture the dynamic trend and be able to have a, a, a credible model out of it. And the next is that we compare this re example with a fully connected multilayer uh, perceptron basically a gigantic uh, neural network, and we can see that the Bayesian result, meaning that we take into consideration of the uncertainties in the weights, uh, with the physics embedded, we can significantly narrow down the uncertainty range in the, pre uh, in the model as well as the predictions. So the way to think about this is this. By incorporating physics into the neural network, we are giving it a positive or favorable uh, inductive bias such that we can narrow down the uncertainty range. And finally, what if there are multiple models that can fit the data relatively well? And we know that both of them, or all of them, are considered well considering the physics. So finally, we can be able to incorporate these different models and give a, a sample and being able to predict the overall uh, uncertainty associated with them, considering all possible uh, models. So in summary, we developed this framework called a reaction, uh, a chemical reaction neural network that we incorporate physics into the architecture of the neural networks, such that we do not need to provide a template to do the fitting. Instead, we can simultaneously learn the chemical pathways, learn how many species are involved, as well as the kinetic parameters. We can further incorporate new physics into it. We can uh, have this potential of uh, 
uh, learning it for other scenarios, uh, our hope is that similar to the chemical um, models that we develop in the physical world that the chemists usually do, is that if we have a new system, we would be able, because we have physics embedded, we would be able to just stack the neurons together to incorporate new species and reactions associated with that. And before I conclude my talk, I want to share with you some of the tools that we developed uh, in the past two years. Uh, and we put it on uh, GitHub, and you can find the link from our group website. Essentially, is that if we want to incorporate more uh, machine learning into our framework, we need to have a differentiable platform. And many of you are using ChemKin, Kantira, and similar toolbox, and uh, it's difficult to write down your own uh, functions to do the uh, back propagation or auto differentiation. So we did it for you. Uh, we we uh, designed a, a framework, and it's on our website. Uh, feel free to try it out. And lastly, I'd like to acknowledge the funding uh, from the NSF uh, under Career Award and our industrial uh, partner, Wei Chai, for the work on the mechanism development. And I would like to have any questions uh, you may have. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, already questions? Thank you very much. Uh, it was a great presentation. And this question is not for challenging you, or just uh, trying to learn. Uh, in terms of like a thermal runaway you mentioned, uh, my understanding of thermal runaway, or maybe just uh, uh, those battery cells, the arrangement is uh, all the cells are used to have the similar materials. Uh, so the material stability is not a problem, unless otherwise you're comparing thermal runaway between different cell stakes. Uh, then uh, the material stability may be come into the picture. But in case of a thermal, st uh, thermal runaway, where you have multiple cells in the arrangement, and multiple cells will have a different behavior because of whatever the reason, which is unknown at, at, the, at this point of time. So I did not understand how that thermal runaway or your CR, um, uh, CRNN will be able to handle that issue. That's one, one question. Of course, I have multiple questions. And uh, the previous part of your presentation shows, uh, uh, talking about the, the chemical kinetics. Uh, so your neural networks, uh, are they be able to uh, help reducing the mechanisms so that uh, they can be used in the practical applications? Uh, I think these are my main questions. I just wanted to learn from you more on that. Great, thank you for the questions. Let me make sure I understand your question uh, correctly. So the first one is on the thermal runaway uh, part. Basically, you, you are saying that there are cell-to-cell -cell variations in the practice and how we can incorporate whatever we learn from the models to model the real situations like that. Uh, yeah. Right, so in that case, because uh, for the real uh, Battery not only have this cathode material, but also many other materials, as well as the manufacturing variability associated with that. So what we want to say is that uh, the cell-to-cell -cell variations due to the failing mode could be different, right? Like you said, it's material A or, or the, the separator or some other things. So what we really want to do is that in the end, we can have a comprehensive model that incorporates many mo models. And also, we have the on-the-fly tracking of the temperature. So based on the temperature history, we would, we would be able to identify what is the failing mode and switch to that model to capture the entire thermal runaway. And the second question, is that whether this framework can be used at, for mechanism reduction, the answer is yes. Uh, so in, in, we, we published paper uh, previously, you can check on our website, is that we use this framework to do reductions as well as optimizations of, of mechanism. Sometimes we know some overly reduced mechanism can be computationally saving when we do CFD. However, the fidelity can be uh, tempered a little bit. So we can also fix the amount of uh, reduction we definitely need to have and uh, compensate that via optimizing the uh, reaction rate and kinetic parameters to keep the same computational cost but achieve a higher fidelity. Um, thank you, Professor Deng, for a great presentation. Uh, my question is how uh, do you expect the system to scale up with larger number of uh, reactions in terms of stability, applicability, compute time? Yeah, that's a wonderful question, and it's a 
good advertisement for my student, Eduardo. So we have a poster, and he, he's a visiting student from Polytechnic uh, University uh, in, uh, in Italy, and he has been uh, exploring this uh, scaling up opportunities for this framework. And feel free to check out the poster tonight. All right, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you very much. <laughs>